Hello CG. Hello family. This is Christian and Ona and baby Nina and Stella and we want to say welcome to the service and we miss you very much. You know, Nina's missing you too. Hi, I'm Fred. Hi, I'm Julia Ellis. We live in Beachview. We've been introduced to Covenant Grace Church by Neville and Dorothy Johanny. We enjoy Greg's uh, expository preaching and teaching. Thank you, we're so blessed. We are intercessors, we pray for you and would love to meet you all. Hey CG, this is Chris Lina and I'm from India. Um, during the lockdown, Pastor Meryl and Dorothy invited me to join the CG Fellowship and it's been a blessing since then to listen to you and been able to serve God with you. So thank you for this opportunity and I pray that God keep you all safe and hope you meet soon. And God bless you all. Thank you. Bye. Good morning and welcome to you all. Welcome Covenant Grace, our visitors. Anyone who's visiting us for the first time, we're so glad that you've tuned in to join us for our service. We've been going through the book of Exodus and Greg reminded me just a few moments ago that we've been doing online services for 20 weeks. In some ways it's gotten easier and in other ways it just feels really, really tough to be looking at a camera, but to know that you are there, that you're watching with us, that you are praying with us and learning from God's word together, that is encouraging. It's good to know that the church, those scattered, are still the church and we're still growing in God. We are still learning from his word. We wanted to remind you of just something that will be happening from this coming Wednesday. We are going to start a series called Doctrine and Devotion. We're going to be going through the New City Catechism. Perhaps you've come across this before. Please join with us, download the app and track each Wednesday at half past seven. We're just going to be chatting on Zoom. It'll be a live feed on YouTube and you can watch with us and learn with us. Before we worship together, I wanted to read from a passage in Matthew. It's a very famous passage. It's the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus goes up onto a mountainside and he teaches his people. In many ways, as we've been going through Exodus, it's been meaty. It's been difficult sometimes to understand these theological concepts as they've been developed. But I want to encourage you to stay with us and be encouraged to know that Jesus teaches from a mountain too. And Jesus teaches directly to your heart and to mine. Jesus teaches in words as clear as they were expressed on Mount Sinai. And he wants us to hear them and he wants us to do them. And so I want to read from Matthew chapter 6, right at the end, at verse 24. Jesus said, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. As we receive the word of God, be like the wise man who built his house on the word of God, on the truth, this truth that we are going to receive today. Things that we can put into practice. We have Jesus' words throughout the New Testament telling us how we should live. God's law, which is good and true. We can put those things into practice and be like a wise man. And the warning is not to be like a foolish man. And so as we sing together, let's worship this God who has given us truth. He has given us words of life. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your words. I thank you that you not only gave your word to us on, on rock, on tablets of stone, but you came to us as Jesus, the rock, the rock on which your church is built, the cornerstone that the builders rejected. God, this truth of who you are, your salvation, it's what we should be building our lives on. God, I pray that you will help us to put this into place. God, I pray that you'll give us the courage to do it when it's difficult, that you would give us eyes to see, 
that you would open the eyes of our hearts to understand your word when we hear it. God, we praise you because you are a holy God. You are a great God. We are reminded as we've gone through Exodus just how great and holy, how, how terrifying you can be, God. Your hand of judgment, but then also your hand of rescue, your hand of power. Thank you that you've extended your hand of mercy and grace to us, that you've given us opportunity to respond to you. I pray that even today, as we hear your word, that we would respond. Each person listening, God, that you would change our hearts, help our hearts to be soft to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My one comfort, both in life and death, is that I am not my own. I was bought with blood, and I confess I belong to you alone. By the Father's good decree, I 
believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Oh Jesus, you are holy. You're the precious Son of God. You're our greatest treasure and our reward. If we have you, Lord Jesus, there is nothing else that we need. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and I ran my hell mouth. 
Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3. Whatever gain I had, I counted it as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. It almost feels like the Apostle Paul could have written this song. All I have is Christ and he is sufficient and he is enough and he is my reward. And so, Father, we thank you for sending Jesus the all-sufficient Savior, our substitute, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. No matter how much we've had in the past, no matter how good we've been, no matter how great we've achieved things, no matter how far we've gone or how high we've climbed, all of that counts for nothing. All of our work, all of our efforts, all of our self-righteousness is rubbish compared to knowing Christ. Paul says he counts it as a loss. His Jewish heritage, his status in the community that he was part of, his learning, he considers it all rubbish compared to knowing Christ. So we join that anthem and we join that chorus of saying, Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. He is enough. He's our comfort. He's our counselor. He's our refuge. He's our mighty God. And with Christ, we have all we need. And so we pray for that comfort and we pray for that peace. We pray for you to draw near to us, even now, Lord, as we participate in the service, as we worship as a church scattered. Won't you come by your Holy Spirit and presence yourself in our midst, in our homes, and most importantly, in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you to the music team for leading us in uh, those beautiful songs of worship. As Jade mentioned earlier, we are in our 20th week of doing online church. And so uh, we are journeying at this particular point through the book of Exodus. And so I'd encourage you to, if you have your Bibles with you, to open them up. Uh, today we are at a interesting point in our journey. We are at Exodus chapter 20. Now last week was chapter 19 and we called that a mountaintop experience. But let me let you in on a little secret. This mountaintop experience is going to last a long time. In fact, we're going to have a mountaintop experience for the next few months because we do not leave Sinai. We are going to be camped out at Mount Sinai with the Israelites in the presence of God. And so we're going to have a great mountaintop experience for the next few months together. Now, this particular chapter introduces to us one of the most famous sections in all of Scripture. Yes, the Ten Commandments. And whether you think they're right or not, these commandments have literally shaped nations around the world. The problem that people have with the Ten Commandments, with these laws, is that they don't like having God tell them what they should do or what they shouldn't do. And it's not that these laws are nasty or uh, very uh, heavy in terms of living them out. I mean, obviously, they're fairly weighty. But the problem really is that we want to decide. As human beings, we want to determine what we should and shouldn't do. And we don't want a God to tell us what's right and what's wrong. And we live in a world that wants to be free to choose however to live their lives. And so the kind of mantra or motto for modern culture is we will live without rules. Now, the irony of that no rules kind of motto is that life without rules is actually a rule of life. And so therein lies the paradox that if you want to live a life without rules, 
that in and of itself is a rule for how you're going to live your life. The reality is that actually true freedom is not found in the absence of rules. True freedom is really found in the presence of the correct rules, of the right rules. For example, silly example, a fish. A fish really is only free in the bounds or constraints of water. The fish might have dreams of freedom as he looks up into the sky, but if he were to be placed in the sky, there would be zero freedom. There would be simple death. And so freedom is found within the bounds of laws, laws that are given for our good and for our human flourishing. And so over the next few weeks, as we are camped out here at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 20, we're going to be walking through one by one through the various Ten Commandments. And we're going to be doing that in the next weeks coming. So starting from next Sunday, we'll be dealing with commandment number one. But what I want to do today is I want to lay down some important foundations for how should we approach the Ten Commandments and how do we approach the law of God in general. Now, generally, we find that there are two groups or two camps when we talk about the Old Testament laws. And these two camps make the same mistake. They misunderstand how we are to live in light of these old covenant laws. These two groups are, one, Christians make the mistake, and two, non-Christians make the mistake. Let's just think about the first group, Christians. These are Christians who love Jesus, they love the Bible, but they still want to observe and practice Jewish laws and customs. And the reason for this is that they believe that God has said things in the Old Testament and they don't want to be disobedient to those things that God has said. And so they have an ethic and it's a good ethic. They want to obey everything that God has said. And so it leads them to the place where they mix Christianity and Judaism and they kind of have a hybrid faith. And some of the things that they would do is they would still see, for example, differences between clean and unclean foods. And so they would refrain from eating pork and bacon, and they would despise themselves of that great privilege and pleasure. Uh, Others would observe certain Jewish feasts and festivals. We hear of Christians celebrating Passover and Christians celebrating bar mitzvahs and Jewish festivals and feasts of all sorts and kinds, even to the point where some mix Christianity and Judaism so much so that they will only ever speak about God in Hebrew terms. They will use God's Hebrew names and they are afraid to use English language to speak about God. And then you get others who are a little bit more petty and they would see tattooing in the same light as adultery. And we could go on and on and on. But generally, these Christians have one eye on Israel and the other eye on Jesus. Now, the problem with this is no matter which way you slice it, you end up, you end up deciding which laws you will observe and which laws you won't observe. And so, In thinking that you are trying to obey God, actually what happens is you become the final authority because at the end of the day, you're not observing all of the laws and and you're not living free of the laws. You are picking and choosing which ones you would like to observe. And anyway, if you did live up to all of them, which no one in history has ever been able to do other than Jesus Christ, then you would be practicing Judaism and not Christianity. So a hybrid sort really doesn't help anybody. Now, the second group, and there's a lot more things we could say about that, but the second group is really where I want to put our thinking caps on. And these are the non-Christians. The non-Christians would look at Christians and they would say, I know that Christians base their whole lives on the Bible. And rightly so, we do. And then they would say, Well, you Christians are supposed to believe the Bible and live your lives according to the Bible. But what I see is you being inconsistent and therefore you are hypocrites. Now, we know that we get accused of that. But what's the the meaning behind it? What's the foundation? Well, the non-Christian fails in a similar area to the Christian 
because they too are misunderstanding how the Bible works. And so they love to quote Old Testament verses. Non-Christians do know Old Testament verses. And they love to quote them, things like this. Well, if you are caught, if you catch someone in adultery, you should be stoning them to death because that's what it says in your Bible. Or for example, they will, they will quote to us verses like, uh, you shall not eat raw meat or shellfish, but you Christians, I see you out at the restaurants and ordering prawns, etc., etc." Or they will quote us uh, other verses like, if you, well, you guys should be keeping the Sabbath. The Bible says that you should keep the Sabbath. And if you don't kill, keep the Sabbath, you should be killed. And then one of the, the strangest, and this is what I often find with these uh, non-Christians, is they love to find the very strange and the very nuanced verses. And, and this one is very strange about you Christians, you shouldn't be eating cheeseburgers. Yes, cheeseburgers. Because in Exodus 23, verse 19, and, and even today, there are some Orthodox Jews who would not eat cheeseburgers because of this verse. It says this, you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Now, whatever that could mean, somehow Orthodox Jews have come to the conclusion that somehow you get cheese and burger and, and this is a forbidden area to go in. And so here's what the non-Christian says. The non-Christian says, hey, you so-called Christians are just picking and choosing which rules in the Bible you want to obey just to suit yourselves. And here's the conclusion they're getting at. The conclusion they're getting at then is, therefore, you've got no right to condemn things like homosexuality when you yourself don't obey the whole Bible. And so as you can see, this is a very important discussion. How are we to navigate our way through God's word? Which, which parts are we to obey and which parts are we not to obey? And so my goal for today is to lay out some truths that will help us navigate our way in solving these issues. So let's jump in at Exodus chapter 20. We're just going to be looking at verses 1 and 2 today. Let's read. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's it. Just those two verses. The first thing I want you to see is who is speaking. It's no longer Moses speaking. Moses has gone up the mountain and it is God speaking. Look at verse one. God spoke all these words. At Sinai, it is God who is speaking. The people of Israel are not only receiving the word of God, they are hearing the voice of God. What an important and incredible way to stress that what God is about to say is incredibly important. It's not Moses' will that we are hearing. It's not the people's will. This is not Jewish tradition. This is the will of God. It's the voice of God. It's the will of God. This is not the counsel of men. This is the counsel of God that we are hearing. Verse 1 goes on and it says, God spoke. And then what did he say? Well, all these words. What words? All these words. Everything that God said on Sinai which includes the Ten Commandments, but a whole lot more. Because what we see here is that everything from chapter 20 all the way through to chapter 23, which includes the Ten Commandments, but a whole lot more. And as we're going to see, there comes more because Moses comes down the mountain, he meets with the people, and then he goes back up the mountain later on, and he receives a whole lot more law. But right here at this particular point, we realize that eventually the Jewish people as a nation are going to end up with 600, just over 600 laws. And here we are at the foundation. We are receiving the first 10. And so within the first 10 commandments, we are receiving kind of the foundation principles that are then followed by many other laws. In chapters 21, 22, and 23, we find what we call case law. Now, these are specific cases that in the nation of Israel, if there was a problem, God is going to weigh in on the problem and he's going to say, this is what you should do. 
And so when we get to chapter 21, we read things like this, the start of every sentence, and you can just browse there if you'd like. It says, when, 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 in other words, when this happens or when that happens or, or, or uh, when this thing situation happens in your life, this is what you should do. Then it moves to whoever, 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 and then it goes back to when, 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 and then in chapter 22, it goes if, 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 and in chapter 23, it's a whole lot of you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. All that to say, everything from chapter 20 all the way through to chapter 23 are God's words. God spoke all these words. So the question then is, well, to whom is God speaking? And the answer is very obvious, but sometimes it's overlooked. God is speaking, verse 2, look at this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That leaves us with absolute clarity as to whom God is addressing. Who is God speaking to all these words? God is speaking to the nation Israel who are now gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai. God is speaking specifically to his rescued Israelites. Now, with that as an introduction, I want to build a case around three points for how we navigate our way through the law of Moses. And my first point is this. The Mosaic law was given as a covenant between God and Israel. You see, the giving of the Ten Commandments with all the other laws is more than just a moral code. It's a covenant. This is a covenant arrangement. It's a covenant agreement between God and Israel. We can't overlook that. That's a very important point for us to acknowledge. This is not a covenant relationship between God and all other nations. It is specific, primarily specific between God and Israel. And although the Ten Commandments apply to all nations because they are linked specifically to God's moral character, we see that they are part of this covenantal arrangement with Israel. The Bible then goes on to call these mosaic laws or this covenantal arrangement, the Bible calls it the old covenant. And so what's taking place here on Sinai is the establishment of the old covenant. And we know it's a covenant because at the end of the giving of the Ten Commandments and then all the case laws in chapter 24, we read this, that we read of a covenant ratification. Have a look at this in verse 7 and 8. Talking of Moses, then he took the book of the covenant. Notice it's not just laws or it's not just a code. It's the book of the covenant. And he read it in the hearing of the people. And then they said, here's the response. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. <laughs> we must remember that because that's not what happens. Anyway, let's read on verse 8. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these, what? Words. And so a covenant has been ratified in blood between God and the people. The blood was cast, sprinkled onto the people, onto the book of the covenant, and they had covenanted to their God that they would live their lives now under this law. Now, this law... Theologians have done some great work and helped us to navigate our way. And, and one of the ways we can navigate our way through all of the different forms in the Mosaic law is using these three general categories. You get the moral law in Moses in the Mosaic covenant. Now, the moral law are the laws that would be governing the ethics or the morality of the people of Israel. And these laws, like I said earlier, are actually rooted in the eternal, unchanging nature and character of God. 
Things like this that we hear, you shall not steal, you shall not lie, you shall not murder, you shall not covet. These are linked, these are moral laws linked to the nature and character of God. Because not only are they being written on stone, but actually they were written on the conscience of every man's heart long before Sinai even happened. So there we have the moral law. Then within the Mosaic law, we also have ceremonial law. Now, the ceremonial law are the laws that govern the religious life of the people of Israel. These were very important laws. These were laws that helped shape them spiritually as the people of God. And, and crucial, central to these laws was the temple or the tabernacle, where we found the altar and the whole sacrificial system and the giving of the temple priests and all of the feasts and all of the Sabbaths and all of the clean and unclean laws were all specifically tied to the ceremonial law given to Moses at Sinai. And then the third category is the civil law which is what shaped them as a civil society. These were the laws that governed their political life. These were the laws that shaped their social life within the nation of Israel. And that's where we find all the various case laws. Now, these three categories, although they are very helpful, at the same time, we see that some of the laws actually overlap with one another. And so although we've got these three categories, sometimes it can get quite frustrating because we can't quite neatly package everything into these three different bins because some of the laws overlap. And we find that in the case with the Ten Commandments. For example, the Sabbath law, which we will talk about in a couple of weeks' time. Now, having said that, I want to have a look as an example at the Fifth Commandment. Because the fifth commandment, which is one we know quite well, says this. And I want to show you here the overlap and the difficulty of compartmentalizing it. Exodus 20 verse 12, it says this. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So who's God speaking to? Well, we've already established that. God is speaking to the Israelites. But this is also part of the moral law. So does that now apply to us today? And the answer would be, yes, it does apply to us today. But then does all of it apply to us today? Well, no, it doesn't all apply. Here's why. Because within this commandment, we see moral law principle of honoring father and mother. But attached to the principle of the moral law is a civil promise. And the civil promise is that you will now live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Well, at a first level, that would be specific to Israel, to the Israelites, that actually they're going to come into the land of Canaan. And if they live and obey this particular law, they can expect a long life. Now, can we today expect a long life in South Africa if we honor our father and our mother? And what happens if someone's life is cut short and they have lived a life of honoring their parents? Has God's word failed? No, not at all. What we see here is that at a first level, this was specifically for the people of Israel coming into the land of Canaan. Now, to complicate matters even more, and I'm not one to try and complicate it, but I want us to try and wrestle through these things. I want you to read what the Bible then says in Exodus 21, because Exodus 21 is part of all the words that God is speaking at Sinai. Look at this, Exodus 21, verse 17. In the same light as what we've just read about honoring your parents, we read this in 21, verse 17. Whoever curses or dishonors, his father or his mother shall be put to death. Now, these are, th this is one of those nice verses for the non-Christians to latch onto, isn't it? Because they can point fingers at us and say, well, you guys are supposed to live under the authority of the Bible, but you don't do this. I've seen some of your people, they don't honor their parents. You should kill them. Well, how do we make sense of this? And this is what I'm arguing. What I'm arguing is that the only way to make sense of this is to see that these laws 
are given within a specific context. And the context that they are being given in is the old covenant. It is an old covenant with Israel. You see, the nation of Israel under the Mosaic law was what we call a theocracy. And that's a really important word for you to understand. If you're going to make sense of the Old Testament and all that's going on in basically two thirds of your Bible, you need to understand this. Because a theocracy means that there is no distinction between religious practice and civil state practice. It's almost like the church and the state are one and the same. That's what a theocracy is. A theocracy is a civil nation under the laws of God. In other words, if you disobey a religious law, it's as if you're disobeying a civil law. There is no distinction. And so the practices in Israel at this point, the practices of Judaism were legislated. And so if you disobeyed the Mosaic law, you were disobeying the state and you could be punished with death. And so the old covenant, the Mosaic law, becomes the constitution for the nation of Israel. It is what governed their whole lives. Now, you might be asking, well, what was the purpose then? What's the purpose of this theocracy? Why the theocracy? Why a nation? Why one nation under the law of God? And that's a very important question. And the answer is that the reason God did this was to prefigure or to picture or foreshadow the kingdom of God. Israel were called to be a holy nation. They were called to be heaven on earth. There was meant to be a picture of the kingdom of God on earth. The Israelites were going to come into the promised land, and the promised land was a typological picture of the kingdom of heaven. They were to live out their lives as if it was heaven on earth. Now, the problem is, they were sinners, which is exactly why God gave them a sacrificial system. But before we look at that, let's just consider this picture. You see, heaven is holy, and so they were to be holy. Heaven has a temple and a throne and an altar, and so Israel were given a temple and an altar and a throne in the tabernacle, in the whole sacrificial system. In heaven, there was God's final and eternal rest. And so Israel were given a picture of that eternal rest in the Sabbath law. And there is no sin in heaven. And so there should be no sin in Israel, which is why they would drive out sin, even to the point of getting rid of people, because sinners were not allowed in the kingdom of God. And so the heavenly Jerusalem gets pictured in the earthly Jerusalem. And all of these Heavenly realities were to be prefigured in the nation of Israel, in the theocracy. Hebrews 8 verse 5 says this, They, speaking about the nation of Israel, they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Listen, this is the only way for us to make sense of how God can give Israel the sixth and the eighth commandment. Which were those commandments? Just think about it. The sixth commandment and the eighth commandment. The sixth commandment is you shall not murder. And the eighth commandment is you shall not steal. But what are they about to do? They're about to go into the land of Canaan and they are going to kill and they are going to steal what belongs to the Canaanites. How do we resolve that? How do we have a God who commands don't kill and don't steal, but then he promises to take them into the land of Canaan and the way they're going to get into Canaan is by killing and stealing and plundering. The only way we make sense of that is that it is foreshadowing the kingdom of God on earth. And what happens when Jesus comes back? When the kingdom of God comes on earth, the very first thing that happens is judgment. The earth is cleansed and the conquest of of Israel going into Canaan, it's a picture of final judgment. 
It's the only way we make sense of it is if we see that Israel under the Mosaic law were a theocracy and it was a temporary arrangement. It was never meant to be an eternal picture. A picture is always temporary of something else that's eternal. Point number two. Now, I know that was longer. Hopefully, these next two will be slightly shorter. Point number two, the Mosaic law, old covenant, is no longer in effect. It's fulfilled. And two things had to happen for this to happen. Because the Mosaic law is very important. Like we said, God is speaking. And so how can it be fulfilled? How can the Mosaic law no longer be binding on believers today? Well, firstly, Israel failed to keep their side of the covenant. Remember, it was a two-sided covenant. It was between God and Israel. And Israel said, hey, we're going to do it. We'll keep the law. But they never did. In fact, they broke all 10 commandments within weeks. They had broken all 10 commandments and more. They failed to possess the land. They failed to be a holy nation. They failed to drive out all the other gods. They failed to be a kingdom of priests. They failed to rule the land. They failed in all ways. And so because of that, they broke this covenant. They broke the covenant with God. God was a husband to them. And then they divorced this relationship with God. And so read with me in Deuteronomy 31 verse 16. This is profound. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. He was old age. This was just before Moses is going to die. And so it wasn't that much longer after Sinai. It says then, Then this people will rise after Moses is gone. And what will they do? And whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering. I mean, what a tragic picture. And he says, and they will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. Then God responds, then my anger will be kindled against them in that day and I will forsake them and hide my face from them and they will be devoured. You see, this old covenant arrangement will be broken. Now, don't get confused because the promise that was made before this covenant, that's going to continue. And so God's plan hasn't failed. Why? Because the promise of the seed still stands. The promise of the seed, capital S, Jesus still stands. And he's going to come through this covenant and he's going to succeed. And that's exactly what we see. God's true vine. John 15, I am the true vine. Israel was like a vine, but here comes God's true vine. And he fulfills all the conditions of the Mosaic covenant. And in keeping the conditions of the covenant, he fulfills the Mosaic covenant. And then even more than just fulfilling it, he lays down his life. And by the shedding of his own blood, he ratifies a new covenant. Just like the covenant ceremony that we saw with Moses, the shedding of blood, the sprinkling of blood on the people, what happens? No, God is shaping and forming here a new covenant. The old covenant is being taken away. And in Jesus' blood, the blood of the lamb is being spilled to form a new covenant with a new covenant people. Matthew 5 verse 17 Jesus said this, do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus hasn't come to renew the old covenant. He hasn't come to abolish the old covenant. He's come to fulfill it. And then Hebrews 8 verses 6 through 13, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the the old. As the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. Verse 7, For if that first covenant, that's the old covenant, had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he, God, finds fault with them when he says. So the problem wasn't the covenant, the problem was the people who were in the covenant. God finds fault with them when he says, 
Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant. God, this was always the plan. I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And the early church were Jewish converts to Christ. Verse 9, not like the covenant, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day. What day? Look at this. When I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And then down to verse 13, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. So in Christ, The old covenant, the Mosaic law as a whole covenant is replaced with the new covenant in Christ. In other words, Israel's theocracy under those covenant laws was ended when Christ came. They were exiled out of the land. Israel failed to keep the land because of their disobedience and God judged them for that and God ended their theocracy and that old covenant was broken and in its place Israel received a true king, a better king based on better promises, not a theocracy but Christ as king, Christ in their midst. Christ was the sacrificial lamb who was slain for their sins. And so in Christ, all of those ceremonial pictures of the altar and the sacrifice and the food laws of clean and unclean, those all get fulfilled in Christ's perfect life and his perfect death. And so all of those laws were types and shadows pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so my conclusion, just before we get to point three, and I'm already concluding, And that is, the conclusion is this, as Christians, we are not required to obey the old covenant. In fact, by obeying all of those Mosaic laws, we are disobeying Christ, who is now the king, the ultimate king, the final king. And we are dishonoring him. If we turn back to Jewish practices and Jewish ways, if we turn back to Jewish theocracy, we are dishonoring Christ and his blood. The third and final point then is this. The moral law found within the Mosaic law is still binding. So although Jesus came to fulfill the whole covenant arrangement, Within that covenant arrangement, there were moral laws, like we said. And those moral laws, Jesus doesn't do away with. In fact, Jesus republishes them. And so the new covenant is not without law. It is with law that is in now Christ's hands. The the law is no longer in the hands of Moses. The law now is in the hands of Christ. And, and, and it's very important that we see what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is that the, the moral law is found within the Mosaic law. So even the Ten Commandments, we can't just say that all ten are flat and straight out moral law that applies to the church today. If we do that, that's how we end up with Seventh-day Adventists. There's a whole movement of churches, there's a whole movement in the world where they view the Ten Commandments as morally binding on Christians today because they see it as the moral law, unchanging. And when it gets to the Seventh Commandment, what do we do? Sorry, not the Seventh, the... Ah, I can't remember. Anyway, it's the command on the Sabbath. And so they are beholden unto that because they see it as part of God's unchanging character. And my argument is there is moral law within the Ten Commandments, but it's given within a covenant context that cannot be ignored that was specific for Israel. But what happens in the New Covenant is that Jesus republishes what laws continue. And there are certain laws that carry on. And he summarizes them in his famous uh, teachings. For example, in Matthew 22, where Jesus summarizes all the law into two laws. And he said, here's what we need to do. Love God and love your neighbor. 
Or the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans 13, verse 8 and 9. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Look at this. For the commandments, now he's referencing where? He's referencing Exodus 20. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment. Any other what commandment? Civil commandment? No, no, no. Ceremonial commandment? No, because those are all fulfilled. Any other moral commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Tim Keller says this. He says, if the New Testament has reaffirmed a commandment, then it is still in force for us today. So as Christians, we can answer the accusation that comes at us from the world, from unbelievers, where they call us inconsistent and hypocrites. And we say, no, we're, we're not. We're actually being incredibly faithful. The reason we're being faithful is because you are misunderstanding how the Bible works. You are failing to see that God's word is progressive and it's set in an old covenant and a new covenant. And there is an important change that takes place. Now, don't get me wrong. God himself does not change, but there is a change in the covenant. And this is where people get it confused. They're worried that if we change laws or if we change the arrangement, then we are assuming that God's changing. No, he's not changing. This is the way he planned it. He planned for there to be promises that would be fulfilled. And so his revelation is progressive or his redemptive acts are progressive. And it's all part and parcel of the beauty of God's story. The beauty of God's story is that we don't have an Old Testament God and a New Testament God. No, that is, that's heresy. There's not two different gods, an Old Testament God who was really nasty and killed people. And then we've got a New Testament God. And the problem with that is that you've got a God coming back at the end of the New Testament who's still going to judge nations and people for their sin. So no, we don't have two different gods. What we have is a God who works progressively in the unfolding of his redemptive story. A God who moves all creation and all things according to his plan, who moves from promise to fulfillment. Guys, let me, I want to just end this with some important examples because you might be thinking, well, how does this apply to my life? And that's been plaguing my mind for the last few days because I'm worried that this is all being a little bit too theological. But I want to bring it home. And the first place I want to bring it home to is this. You see, even the early church got this mixed up. In, in, uh, in Acts 15, we see Peter and James and the apostles meeting because some of the Jews who've now become Christians were thinking that they still needed to obey the Mosaic law in order to be fully pleasing to God. And so they have this huge council debate. And eventually, Paul has to write a whole letter to the Galatians showing them that they're no longer under the Mosaic law. So it was a very important thing. And you can understand why this is a little bit sometimes confusing for people because even the early church wrestled with this. But not only did the early church wrestle with this, church history is littered with sad stories. I've already mentioned them. The Seventh-day Adventists um, have got a few things wrong precisely because of how they view the Mosaic Covenant. But they're not the only ones I want to pick on. I also want to pick on some that we call theonomists. Now, that might be a new word for you, but here's what they are. Theonomists are those people who want to Christianize society. And the way they're going to Christianize society is by the laws of God. And you might be thinking, well, who's done that? Well, I'll tell you who tried to do that. The South African government tried to do that. Under the apartheid era, the government in South Africa combined church and state in one legal entity. And so 
You could not have a shop open on a Sunday and no one was allowed to go to the shops. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, you need to submit to the law of God that says that Sunday is the Lord's day. And so whether you believe it or not, whether you subscribe to it or not, it's a law in the land. Now, if you push that too far, and you might be thinking, oh, that, that's not too bad. Well, if you push that too far, you know what you get? You get murder. You get racial discrimination. You get two different classes of people. And if you push it further than that, you get Nazi Germany. That's what Nazi Germany was. The fundamental philosophy, the ideology behind Nazi Germany was theonomy. We're going to rule the nations because God has given us a mandate. You see, this has been a problem throughout history. When you misunderstand theocracy, and you think that you're going to rule people's lives under the law of God in the hand of Moses, it's a very dangerous path. So what's the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is God's new covenant people are not a state nation. We are not a state nation. We are a pilgrim people. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. Church, we are citizens of heaven. Heaven is our citizenship. We are citizens of heaven here on earth. We are pilgrims in this wilderness. We are journeying through. I hope you see why this is important. And as we go into each of the commandments in the following weeks coming, I hope that this lays a helpful foundation for you. I want to wrap this all up with one last reading, and that's from Galatians 4. Thanks for hanging in here with me. Galatians 4 verse 21. Paul says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Now, he's got Mosaic law in mind. Do you not listen to the law? In other words, he says, no, Moses didn't only write the commandments. Moses also wrote about Abraham. Now, he uses Abraham as an example. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and one by a free woman. In other words, He's recalling to mind Isaac and Ishmael. When, when Abraham took matters into his own hands, he slept with the slave woman and he had Ishmael. But when he held on to the promise of God, Sarah eventually conceived and she gave birth to Isaac. Now look at what he says, verse 23. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. That's when he took matters into his own hands while the son of the free woman, Sarah, was born through promise. That's Isaac. Verse 24. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One, he says, is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar, the slave woman who gave birth to Ishmael, is Hagar, and she corresponds with Sinai, the Mosaic law. Look what he says about it, verse 25. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Do you notice what he's saying there? He's saying that if you are stuck in Judaism, if you are stuck under the Mosaic law, you are like a slave. You missed the whole plan of God. The plan of God was for you not to stay under the Mosaic law. The plan of God, the promise of God was that you would come out and become a child of promise, a child of Sarah. Look what he says in verse 26. But the Jerusalem from above, the Jerusalem above is Free, and she is our mother. In other words, he's talking to the Jews and he says, listen, you might have got the right father. You might say Abraham's our father. But the question I want to ask you is, who's your mother? You might say Abraham's your father, but who's your mother? That really matters. Is Sinai your mother or is Christ Jesus your mother? spiritual mother in the sense. Is it the old covenant who's mothering you or is it the new covenant in Christ? And then he ends his argument and he says in verse 30, but what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. And who does that represent? The Mosaic 
covenant, the Mosaic law. Get rid of it. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. And I really do pray that all of this theology and all of this incredible truth would help shape us as a people, to be a people on mission and to understand the nuances of, of how we are to live under the, the law, the law in the hand of Christ and how we are to be your people. According to 1 Peter, your word says that we are a royal priesthood, a chosen race, a people under the mercy of God, a people who are now the new covenant people of God, both Jew and Gentile. And so we pray, Lord, that you would use us as a light to the nations. We thank you, Lord, that your plan never failed. Yes, people failed, but your plan succeeded. And so we thank you for Jesus, that all of our hope and all of our rescue and all of our delight is found in Christ. He is our covenant savior. He is our covenant Lord, and we are his covenant people. All glory be to you. Amen. I'm going to hand over to the music team. They're going to lead us in one last song together. There's no deed that can redeem us There's no right nor magic word Only by the work of Jesus Can salvation be secure It is finished, He has done it Let your weary heart rejoice Our a shout with ragged voice and go bravely into battle knowing he has won the war it is finished lift your head and weep no more there's no sacrifice Offer, there's no penance to complete. Freely drink of living water without money, come and feast. It is finished, He has done it. Let your weary heart rejoice. Our redemption is accomplished. Raise a shout. not looking to this earthly land they were looking to the heavenly land 
where Christ reigns as King, ruler of all. And we thank you, Lord, that through your precious blood, there is a new covenant, a covenant that embraces all people of every nation and every tribe and every tongue who surrenders to Christ. And it's through this nation that your kingdom is coming on earth. And so we pray, Lord, that you'd give us wisdom as to how to live as citizens of heaven while we are here on earth. And as we navigate our way through the Ten Commandments in the weeks to come, Lord, we pray that you would empower us to be a distinct, holy people, called by you and shaped by your Spirit. Write your laws on our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Don't forget to uh, jump onto our YouTube channel on Wednesday night for Doctrine and Devotion. If you want to journey with us through the New City Catechism, download the app onto your device, and then follow along with us Wednesday, 7.30. God bless you, we miss you, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks for joining us today. Usually after the service, we would chat and grab a cup of coffee. We can't do that, but you can respond by clicking like, commenting, or subscribing. Thank you to all of you who partner with Covenant Grace Church. We appreciate your prayers, your financial giving, and also the messages that you send us throughout the week. If you want to know how you can partner in this gospel opportunity, please won't you find details below. Have a great week.